Valentine's Day. It's supposed to be a time for love and celebration, spending time with that special someone. But that's not what happened for Nicole Waller on Valentine's Day back in 2013. This is her story. Today's video is a holiday homicide, which means it has a holiday component to it. And because of Valentine's Day is coming up, I thought it would be fitting to talk about a story that happened on Valentine's Day. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. And before we get into the story for today, I want to thank our sponsor for this video. It's a new year, time for new habits, and the perfect brand to help you with new health goals is today's sponsor, Care Of. And Care Of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently to your door every month. It's 2023 and I'm trying to love myself more and feel more energized. Think about something attainable that you want to feel this year, like less overscheduling and feeling more grounded or feeling more accepting and in tune with your body. Care Of can help you feel more in control of your health goals this year with personal guidance and encouraging healthy habits so you can see and feel results. You take a short, in-depth quiz about your lifestyle and your health goals for personalized recommendations, taking the guesswork out of what supplements are best suited for you. It would take me forever to research everything my body needs. And that's why I like Care Of because it makes it so easy to stick to a healthy routine when life gets crazy. They have a daily app to remind you to take your vitamins, individual travel ready packs, and a flexible subscription that you can change up at any time by simply retaking the quiz for some extra support when you need it. I love how it gives you this information sheet with all of my personalized vitamins listed. And I wanted to share mine with you because I thought that would be kind of fun. I'm taking the astaxanthin for skin and eye health, the cranberry for urinary tract health, which you definitely need as a woman, the vitamin B12 for energy, and the plant protein to cover any nutrition gaps because I am a vegetarian. I also added this new sleep blend since I have so many thoughts going through my mind at night. I thought I would try something to get a little more sleep. I know how busy all of you are as well and I thought that Care Of would be the perfect brand to introduce to all of you. Now is the perfect time for you to try it. You get 50% off for your first Care Of order. Just go to takecareof.com and enter code KIMBER50 or just look in the description box for the link below. That's 50% off your first care of order at takecareof.com and enter code Kimber50. I'm gonna put it up on the screen for all of you. I want to thank Care Of once again for supporting my channel and sponsoring today's video. Now let's get into the case for today. The first thing I wanna do is introduce you to Nicole Yvonne Waller. She was born May 22, 1981 in Flathead Valley region of Northwestern Montana, and she was referred to as Nikki to those who knew and loved her. Nicole was said to be a social butterfly. She was referred to as a very loud, free spirit, and she had a sister named Carmen who said Nicole was very to the point and blunt, and I can be that way too, but she was also a wild child. She loved to have fun, and she was borderline mischievous. Nicole loved to make people laugh. She was the type of person that would give you the shirt off of her own back. And as a child, Nicole and her family moved to Alaska where she spent most of her childhood. But they returned to Kalispell, Montana in the late 1990s. And not long after returning there, Nicole's parents ultimately got divorced. But by the time Nicole was 18 years old, she was starting a family of her own. She got pregnant with her then boyfriend and she decided it was time to calm her life down and create a good life for herself and her baby. She gave birth to a little girl that she named Ashlyn. However, Nicole did decide to leave Ashlyn's father not long after she was born because she really wanted to create a good life for the two of them because that was a really unhealthy relationship and I respect that. So many times people stay together and they say it's for their child, but in a lot of these situations, it's probably better for the child that they don't stay together. The next relationship that Nicole had was with a man named Jason Waller and she went on to marry him in 2002 at the age of 21 years old. And they had two sons together, Austin and Richie. Nicole and Jason had a good relationship for a long time, but then things soured and the two decided that it was best for them to separate. 
They did remain close despite the separation. And after the separation from Jason, Nicole ended up reconnecting with a friend from high school and his name was Cody Johnston. Nicole's family took Cody into their home and let him stay with them for a few months back in 1997 when Cody was just a senior in high school. The two reconnected through good old Facebook and eventually began dating. Now, Nicole's friends and family liked Cody. They were very fond of him. They knew him to be a kind and caring man and they thought that maybe this was gonna be the one, the complete package that Nicole needed. Cody was a diesel mechanic out in the oil fields and he was making upward of six figures a year. So that was pretty good. A nice quality for Nicole to see in a man who could take care of her and her children. Somebody stable, somebody that had a good job and a good income. At the time that Cody and Nicole reconnected, she was living in a single wide trailer in Kalispell and Cody was living in a home in Fairview, Montana. They had a long distance relationship where Nicole would travel to Fairview and Cody would travel to Kalispell for them to see one another. Nicole would do this anytime her kids were with their father. Around five months into their relationship, Cody generously purchased a trailer for Nicole and her children to live in. Nicole sold her single wide trailer for $10,000 and applied these proceeds towards the purchase of the double wide trailer from Cody. There was a balance of $2,000 left which Nicole had agreed to pay in monthly payments to Cody. However, throughout the relationship, Nicole had not been making these payments, but Cody didn't pursue any kind of actions to enforce their original agreement. Sometimes that happens in relationships. You know, you're with someone, so there's exceptions made, and they were dating, so they probably just figured along the way Nicole would pay back the money. Nicole would tell her sister Carmen that she was so happy. It was the happiest that she had ever been when she was with Cody. And it was important that Nicole did have someone who was caring and considerate of her because Nicole had a health issue and that issue had a big impact on her life. She needed someone who would be understanding, especially if complications came along and those health issues got worse. And unfortunately in 2008, that happened. Nicole discovered that she had a tumor in her brain. She had surgery and had to have a shunt put in which would help drain the internal blockages in her brain. This is a pretty big ordeal. And the operation resulted in Nicole no longer being able to work. She had been working as a certified nursing assistant, but she had to quit after her surgery due to the pain that she was experiencing. Nicole was on medication and she was taking it to relieve this pain, but often it just was not good enough. Nicole had a good friend, Mark Hines, that stepped up to become her caretaker after her surgery and to help her get back on her feet and take care of the household and things that Nicole could no longer do by herself. So her and Cody meeting on Facebook, they did have a long distance relationship. They were about nine hours away from each other, but they would make the trip to see one another pretty often. Nicole's ultimate goal was to be closer to Cody and one day move near him. But they were kind of still testing the waters, seeing how their relationship progressed. Over the months that Cody and Nicole were together, she began moving her belongings to Cody's home in Fairview because ultimately her goal was to move there with her children once her divorce was finalized. Nicole and Jason, her ex, were coming up on a time where they were going to be signing divorce papers and Nicole had planned after signing the papers to take her children and move the 500 miles away across the state to Montana, North Dakota border where Cody lived in the town of Fairview. She did have slight reservations as the state was approaching and Nicole confided in her mom that she was nervous to move because she thought that area had become a lot more dangerous with an influx of workers and people who had moved there due to the back and oil boom but she really wanted to be closer to Cody. This fear was somewhat warranted. Crime in one county in the area had actually risen at the time by 855% since the prior decade. There was something else worrying her. Cody and Nicole were going through a little bit of a rough patch with everything that had happened with the surgery and Nicole's life changing and their relationship was just a little shaky at the time. They had just been bickering a little more lately than they had before. And Nicole told her sister Carmen that she started feeling like Cody was being secretive with her. She just felt like something was off and she couldn't put her finger on it. However, she didn't let that stop her. Everybody goes through these rough patches here and there and Nicole was determined to make it work. Now in 2012, for just a short period, Nicole and Cody did break up. And during that time, he started seeing someone else a woman named Amber Fleming. This short break between Cody and Nicole didn't last very long and they ended up getting back together. Nicole decided in February of 2013 to make the close to nine hour drive from her home in Kalispell 
to Cody's home in Fairview. She told everyone close to her before she left that this trip was to see if her and Cody were still connected, if they could still work things out. If not, they were gonna call it quits. It's an interesting time to do it since Valentine's Day was coming up and it was the evening before Valentine's Day, Wednesday, February 13th, 2013, when Nicole texted her sister, Carmen. She said, quote, couldn't work it out. I'm coming home tomorrow, end quote. And the next morning, February 14th, 2013, Valentine's Day, Nicole sent the last text message that would ever come from her at 7.25 a.m. And that message went to Mark Hines, her caretaker, who was waiting for her back in Kalispell. And it said, I'm on my way. However, it wasn't until days later on Monday, February 18th, that anyone would realize something wasn't right. That day on the other end of Montana, Nicole's friend and caretaker was reporting her missing. Nicole had a doctor's appointment for Friday, February 15th, and she didn't show up. And it wasn't like her to do something like that. She never missed her doctor's appointments. Her caretaker, Mark, and her friend, Faith Ask, had tried contacting Nicole. They called her cell phone, and it went straight to voicemail. Faith did leave a message, but she didn't hear back from her. So they drove by Nicole's house to see if she was there, and that's when she noticed that Nicole's vehicle was not in the driveway. Faith decides to call the police on February 18th and file a missing persons report. At this point, no one had even contacted Carmen or anyone else in Nicole's family before filing this police report about her being missing. Carmen found out the very same day, February 18th, that Nicole was missing when that same caretaker called her to let her know that Nicole had missed that doctor's appointment. Carmen was used to Nicole taking a couple days to recoup after getting back from a trip to Cody's. And then she'd usually hear from her. So prior to that phone call from the caretaker, she wasn't really concerned. She figured she would hear from her when she was ready to talk. She knew she was going through a lot. Once Carmen did hear the news, she tried calling and texting her. And when she never heard back from her, she decided to contact the county sheriff's office and report Nicole missing. Carmen had to break the news to her mother, and it was one of the hardest things she ever had to do. Her mom was like, what is going on? And Carmen had to explain that she just got a phone call that Nicole was missing. Nicole's mom starts frantically yelling at Carmen, not out of anger, but because she's so worried and fearful, she knows that Nicole has a medical condition. She's got three kids. What did Carmen mean she's missing? An FBI agent and an officer ended up coming to Carmen's house and telling her that a highway patrol trooper had actually flagged Nicole's vehicle in Poplar, Montana. There was a lot going on that day. Nicole's 1999 Burgundy Ford Expedition had been found parked on the side of Highway 2 by a highway patrol officer. The exact same area that her vehicle was found in was this desolate area on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. Nicole's vehicle ended up 70 miles away from Cody's home. These roads throughout Montana are desolate. If you break down or something happens, it could be hours until somebody comes to find you. The specific area where Nicole's vehicle was found actually had a nickname, Stab City, because of the extraordinary amount of stabbings that occur in this area. That is not a good sign. The trooper approached the vehicle and he noticed that it was full of personal belongings. All the doors were locked. The trooper's listening, and he hears a really odd sound coming from inside. He doesn't recognize it, but he is concerned. He thinks that someone could be stuck inside the vehicle, and it is five degrees outside. So he felt it was necessary to get into that vehicle as fast as possible. When he did manage to get inside, that's when he discovered where the noise was coming from. Two live guinea pigs. And I felt so sad when I heard this. I love those little things. They're so adorable. Two of them were in the vehicle, thankfully still alive. The thing is, the officer doing this preliminary search, he finds Nicole's keys in the center console. He attempts to start the vehicle and realizes there's nothing wrong with it. So it's not as though Nicole broke down in his perspective. It's as though she stopped here for some reason and then locked the keys inside the vehicle and walked off. But why? I actually have some photos of inside Nicole's vehicle. And as you can see, everything looks fairly normal. All of her belongings are inside. But there was a cover on the steering wheel that was hanging off. You can see it behind the steering wheel right here. Now, when the vehicle was transferred to the impound lot to be searched, it looked as if Nicole had packed up her life. All kinds of belongings were in the vehicle. And in the back seat, I noticed a photo album. 
It looks like the front cover has her and Cody on it. There are some pill bottles that were found in the vehicle as well. And this is medication that needs to be taken every six hours. As well as this box, I noticed it was a lock box and it had a lot of prescription medications inside. That was kind of peculiar to me, but we know that Nicole had health problems and she needed medication, but why were they left inside the vehicle? Her family said she wouldn't go anywhere without her medication. Not only that, the family pets were in this vehicle, the two guinea pigs. Nicole loved animals. She would have never left them unattended like that. There is also this calendar. It's a February calendar, as you can see, and it's on the floor here. And on the calendar, if you look closely, I know it's not the best photo, but you can see there are things filled in for weeks to come. Look on November 14th, there's a heart, and it says Cody forever. Obviously, from what we know, they broke up the night before Valentine's Day. So of course, she might have written this before she left his house. But there were appointments on this calendar and other things written down that she was going to attend to. One of the first things that Carmen and her mom did was call hospitals close by. They thought maybe because of Nicole's neurological condition, something happened to her on this long drive home. But Nicole wasn't at any of the hospitals. Carmen decides to call Nicole's ex-husband, Jason Waller, to see if he's heard from Nicole, and he says no. The last time he spoke to her was at 7 o'clock in the morning on Valentine's Day. Jason said that Nicole called to let him know that she was on her way home from her boyfriend Cody's. Jason was watching the kids, so she had to let him know she would be back sometime later that night. Carmen decided to band together with her friend Angie, as well as Nicole's longtime friend Cami from high school. They were posting on Facebook trying to get the word out. When Cami first heard Nicole was missing, knowing her so long, she was under the impression that Nicole might have just wanted to go off the grid. Maybe she was stressed. Maybe she was having a moment. She wasn't thinking clearly. At least that's what they were hoping. But after a while, they started to think something else happened. They didn't think something like this could happen to one of their own friends or family members. But those thoughts started to creep in. Was Nicole okay? Did something bad happen? Carmen decided to go to social media and share the news that her beloved sister was missing. She wrote in a post, quote, Hey friends and family, we have some pretty devastating news today. My sister is missing. I need help. Comments were coming in. They were rolling in saying that police needed to check Nicole's boyfriend. Because of course, it seems to always be the boyfriend or the husband in these situations. And there is a saying, I think I've only said it once in another one of my videos a long time ago. It goes like this. It's either the lover, the brother, or the significant other. At least that's what they say. And this time is no different. They really think the boyfriend has to have something to do with it. Nicole's friends and family, however, do not think Cody was involved. They said that Nicole was like a tornado sometimes, and Cody was one of those people that could calm her storm. They were adamant that Cody would not hurt Nicole. Plus, just a year prior to this, around the area where Nicole's vehicle was found, a teacher named Sherry Arnold had gone missing. She disappeared one morning when she was taking a run, and it ended up being two random men that had killed her. So the police weren't going to just focus in one direction, especially because Sherry Arnold's case was still fresh in their minds. Like I said, the family had known Cody since they were all in high school. So when investigators asked them what they thought about Cody and if he had anything to do with this, they said there's no way he has anything to do with her disappearance. Of course, Cody was one of the first people that Carmen called, and he said he hadn't heard from her since Thursday, which was Valentine's Day, the day she left his house. And Carmen was like, listen, my sister's missing. She never made it home. Nevertheless, the police still do have to bring Cody in for questioning because he was Nicole's boyfriend and he was the last person that anyone knew had seen her. So he willingly comes in, he's very cooperative with investigators, and he's open to answering their questions. Cody told the investigators that on February 13th, Nicole and him did have an argument. And they did decide that they were going to break up. And remember, that was sort of the point of this entire trip to see if they still wanted to be together. Of course, after this happened, he didn't feel like it was right to be close to each other in that moment, so he went to his job site and he slept there for the night so that she could stay where she was and feel comfortable and he could just get space. And he was there with another one of his workers. So Cody said the next morning, Valentine's Day, Nicole texted him that morning, letting him know his dog was hungry and needed some food. And this was around seven o'clock in the morning. He said that Nicole also called him 
a couple times that morning. But to be fair, he really didn't want to talk to her at the time. Cody said at this point, he turned his phone off. He just wanted to get some sleep. He went back to sleep until 8 o'clock. Nicole was packing up all of her belongings to move back to her home in the double wide. He goes on to say that when he woke back up, he got on his computer and he actually terminated the service on Nicole's cell phone. Maybe out of spite, I don't know, but she was on his phone plan. And now that they broke up, he just figured, I'm not paying for it anymore. So he turned off her service. He said he wanted to turn her phone off because she kept texting and calling and he really didn't want to hear from her anymore. So his only option in his mind was to shut off her service. So now they're thinking, maybe this is the reason Nicole didn't text anyone. She was always texting, especially on her way home. And maybe something did happen to her and without her phone, that could be a big problem. She could be stranded somewhere and not be able to call for help. Cody said that he was aware that Nicole had planned on leaving that morning. And he decided that it would be best for him to just stay at his job site until she left so that he did not have to see her. It was just too hard on him, and he told the investigators he ended up staying at his job site until about lunchtime, and that's when he drove back to his house, which he claimed was empty when he arrived. Back in Kalispell, Nicole's friend Cami had noticed there wasn't any talk about Nicole or her disappearance on the news, and there were no search parties that were getting ready to go out and look for her. And she remembered seeing Sherry Arnold's face plastered all over the news. Search parties were out there looking for her right away, and she couldn't understand why Nicole wasn't getting the same attention, and that would bother me too. So she decided to take matters into her own hands, and she created a Facebook page called Find Nicole Waller in order to post updates about the search for Nicole and to try to get word out there about her disappearance. She was hoping that she would receive help from the public if they had any information. Cami was really upset. She told everyone that she was going to start her own search party in Montana, but the law enforcement officers told her she wasn't allowed to do that. And she felt so helpless. Law enforcement explained it wasn't as though they were trying to treat Nicole's case any differently from Sherry Arnold's, but there were differences. For example, Sherry was snatched while jogging. Her shoe was found on the side of the road, and that was a clue. They knew there was some kind of foul play, and there were a lot of leads. But in Nicole's case, there just wasn't. They didn't know where to search. On February 20th, 2013, Carmen was tossing and turning in bed. And that's when she hears a text come in on her phone. So she went to check it and she saw it was actually a Facebook message from her sister, Nicole. So Carmen's excited. She cannot believe it. She's like, wait a minute. She's responding. What's going on? She's reading the message. This meant her sister was still alive, but this excitement would not last very long. The message from her sister said, quote, everybody had a lovely evening, not coming home. Don't laugh at me. Sorry, I let everyone down, end quote. So Carmen quickly messages Nicole back. She asked her, where are you? She let her know that she hadn't let anyone down and that there were lots of people who were worried about her and looking for her. Of course, when she gets this message from her sister, she gets out of bed in the middle of the night. She calls her friend Angie and she's like, oh my gosh, I just got this message from Nikki. So they both get out of bed and now Angie's messaging Nikki through Facebook and they're trying to figure out if they could get any information, but Nicole never replied to this message. All hope was gone at this point. So she kept her message a secret. She didn't want to let her family know that Nicole had reached out because she didn't know if this was really Nicole and she didn't want to get their hopes up. It just wasn't usual for Nicole not to answer her back. And after a while, Carmen began to grow skeptical of this Facebook message from Nicole for various reasons. She felt that Nicole wouldn't have just messaged her one time and then not replied to pretty serious questions like, where are you? People are worried. That was a very uncharacteristic of Nicole. She was also a textaholic. She was always on her phone. Also, Nicole was a notoriously bad speller. She was known to abbreviate words whenever possible. And this message was spelled out completely with no abbreviations, no incorrectly spelled words, and the investigators on the case soon determined they did not believe that that message actually came from Nicole. And that's me to AT. I am notorious for misspelling text messages. A lot of mine do not make sense. I'm glad we can now edit them. I do a lot of voice to text because of my long nails. Can anyone else relate? I don't know. It was also kind of strange that Nicole had said, I had a lovely night because she's been gone a week. Why would she say she had a lovely night? There has been many nights that have passed. It just didn't make sense. However, they were also thinking 
Maybe this all had to do with her neurological issues. Maybe she was having some kind of episode and wasn't thinking clearly. So now investigators are wondering who would have been using Nicole's Facebook to message her sister. Well, of course, Cody is not the only man in Nicole's life. Nicole also had Jason, her ex, who she was separated from, and they were nearing the day that they were supposed to sign the official divorce papers. With Nicole's relationship with Cody getting more serious and her considering moving across the state with her children, investigators had to consider the fact that Jason could have a motive. They quickly discovered that he and Nicole were still friends. They had a very good relationship with each other, especially a great co-parenting relationship. The two even had an open door policy. Either one could stop by each other's houses whenever they wanted to in order to see their children. Also, everybody that investigators talked to about Jason let them know that he was a good dad and he wouldn't harm Nicole. He had no reason to. They were amicably getting a divorce. It didn't take long for investigators to rule out Jason for the time being. But speaking of more than one person in someone's life, investigators learned that Nicole hadn't been the only woman in Cody's life. Cody had started dating a new woman. Her name was Amber Fleming. And he started this relationship after Nicole disappeared. However, that's what people thought. It turns out this relationship had been going on before Nicole went missing. Nicole and Amber actually knew one another through their friend, Cammy. Amber was a teacher. She was actually in Cammy's wedding in 1999. They all went to high school together. Nicole was actually a bridesmaid in that wedding and Amber was the maid of honor. This is Nicole and Amber standing next to each other at the wedding. They were more of acquaintances than they were friends, but they did have a mutual friend with Cammy. But they came from two different friend groups. However, they were still friendly and they got along and Cammie considered herself best friends to both Nicole and to Amber. They did interview Amber. She let the investigators know that she was under the impression that Cody and Nicole's relationship was over and that Nicole had left Cody's house to return to her home. And she said to her knowledge, Cody and Nicole's relationship ended on Valentine's Day. And she said she spent the whole weekend with Cody after Nicole had left. She didn't find anything suspicious about his behavior at all. She said he would never do anything that would jeopardize his relationship with her. Meaning, if they were thinking he harmed Nicole, he wouldn't, for Amber's sake. Amber said he doesn't even like to fight or argue. Amber was adamant that he was at work the entire time, and she even had a list of people who saw him there. She signed a release to let them look at her phone, and eventually, information would come out that would turn this case on its head and help investigators to narrow their sights onto one suspect. Nicole's birthday had come and gone May 22nd, and her missing persons flyers were still being hung up all around town with her name and her date of birth and her height, only five foot, brown hair, hazel eyes, and the last time she was seen. Later, Cody decided to go to the double wide trailer and empty it of most of Nicole's belongings without even consulting her family. Even though he had previously told Carmen that she could go inside her sister's home to remove personal belongings. He did end up letting her go in there in June, but that's after he already was inside and threatened Carmen that if she wasn't gonna come clean the whole thing out, then she couldn't retrieve any of Nicole's things. Cody ultimately sold the double wide trailer a few months after Nicole's disappearance and he didn't share any of the proceeds with Nicole's family, even though she put forth $10,000 towards the purchase. Cody was the one person that everyone knew was trying to help Nicole financially and otherwise. Nicole's daughter, Ashlyn, was not keen of any of Nicole's other boyfriends, but Cody was different. She actually started to consider him more like a father figure since her own dad was out of the picture. However, they did have their ups and downs and they would break up and then get back together. But five months before she went missing, her and Cody were back together, what seemed like for good. But it was kind of under false pretenses. It turns out, Carmen lets investigators know that Nicole lied. Nicole lied and told Cody that she was pregnant with his child when she wasn't. She actually went so far as to take someone else's ultrasound pictures and doctor them up to make them look like they were hers. It turns out that this is kind of the reason why her and Cody were having issues and why they ultimately broke up that Valentine's Day. Because just a month before was when Cody found out the truth that Nicole had lied, that they had gotten back together under false pretenses. Everything started to break down. 
she finally admitted she wasn't pregnant. So Carmen had a best friend that lived in a little town in Montana called Culbertson. He was a principal at a school that was right beside the road that Nicole would have had to take along the way back home. So they're searching for any kind of camera footage that could help in the investigation. And Carmen asked this friend, this principal friend, if she would be able to get the footage from Valentine's Day and see if they could find anything on that tape that would be helpful. As the principal goes through this footage on the day that Nicole had last been heard from, he recognized a vehicle that matched the description that Carmen had given him of Nicole's vehicle. A two-tone maroon SUV that matched the description of Nicole's vehicle is seen driving by the school. This was the only surveillance camera between Cody's home and the Poplar area where the vehicle was found, and it was on top of the high school. The time that Nicole's vehicle passed the school was a little odd because her last text messages to her caregiver was at 7.25 in the morning. Her car passed the school at around 10.09 a.m. This school was only 30 miles away from Cody's, so this meant it took her two hours to go 30 miles. That just didn't make sense. That's why the investigators continued to watch the tape before Nicole's vehicle passed and after Nicole's vehicle had passed, and they didn't have to wait long to see what happened after. Here's the thing. Very quickly after that SUV exits the security camera's frame, another vehicle approaches. It looks like it's following the SUV. That's creepy. I can just imagine this playing out. Imagine watching this and thinking, what's going on? This second vehicle was a Ford F-350 and it had an amber light on the top of it. When I say an amber light, this is an amber warning light on top of a vehicle. This is what it looks like. It's similar to what a cop would have on their car, except yellow. Neither one of these vehicles' license plates were visible on camera, but investigators felt as if the Ford F-350 was distinct enough with that amber light on top of it that they would be able to figure out who owned it fairly quickly. And they were right, Bill Soderberg. They get his name from locals, and when they go to Bill's farm, they see the F-350, and sure enough, it has an amber light on top. This was the investigator's biggest lead yet. Was Nicole in this person's farmhouse? Is this person a suspect? Or is this person a witness? Bill and his wife come to the door. Investigators tell Bill they need to speak with him along with an FBI agent. So they take him out of the house and they begin to explain what's going on. There were two investigators and an FBI agent and they didn't even notice since they were so fixated on getting Bill to explain why his car was following Nicole's, they didn't notice. Bill had a 45 caliber gun in his hand while being questioned. Soon, one of the investigators realized it and said, Bill, can you please put your gun down? And he took out the magazine and put it down. He made sure it wasn't loaded, but that's really not a good first impression. What ended up happening, according to Bill, is that he thought the FBI agent was a hitman because of the way he was dressed, so he got his gun. He thought they were there to kill him. At least that's what he said. Why was he so scared? Why did he think a hitman was after him? Well, wait till you hear what he really thought and who he thought sent these men, his buddy, Cody. But why in the world would Bill assume his friend would wanna send people to kill him? That's what investigators wanna find out. And he's very cooperative from the beginning. He let investigators know that Cody did call him on Valentine's Day morning. And he asked him if he would be able to pick him up and give him a ride back from Poplar. Cody told Bill that Nicole had driven off with another man. And because of this, he was wanting to abandon her vehicle as a prank. Does that make any sense to you? Who is this other man? Why didn't, why didn't Cody tell investigators about this other man? I mean, he said that they argued and that they broke up, but wasn't it their intention to find out whether their relationship was going to work out? And why would a friend think this is a funny prank? To abandon a vehicle somewhere. More grown adults in this situation. Around 9.30 that morning, Cody got into Nicole's Ford Expedition and drove it to meet Bill. Bill says he then followed Cody about a mile past Poplar, where Cody then stopped, got out of the Ford Expedition, locked the doors, and got into Bill's truck. Bill told the investigators that he also noticed that Cody had on white leather gloves when he got out of the vehicle, and as he got into Bill's truck, he notices Cody has two cell phones. Two. And Bill didn't find this suspicious at all. I mean, I guess he did because he noticed. Bill told the investigators that as they made their way toward Sydney, Cody had been busy taking apart one of the cell phones that he had with him. He's taking apart a cell phone. Sir, 
I would find that really suspicious. Bill also let the officers know that multiple times that day, Cody had asked him if he had, wait for it, a barrel that Cody could have. Really? Bill responded that he had some at his house, but Cody told him he would need one that had a lid on top of it, which Bill didn't have. He was basically asking for a 55 gallon drum, according to Bill. That's more than enough room to fit a body inside, and he wanted one with a lid on it. Bill also let the investigators know that Cody had called him the very next day and said, hey, if anyone were to ever ask about that day, Valentine's Day, to just forget that the two of them had ever taken that little ride to Poplar and back. Just erase it from your memory. I was watching Dateline, and they had this really interesting phrase that I'd never heard before. They said, a good friend will help you move, but a best friend will help you move a body. I had never heard this before in all the years that I've been watching true crime and researching true crime. So is it true? Would you do that for a friend? Did Bill do that? After their conversation with Bill, the police felt as though they needed to detain Cody and question him once again. I think so. After being detained and brought in at gunpoint to be questioned, Cody remained pretty quiet. He repeatedly asked the investigators, why are you questioning me again? Why am I here again? Cody told investigators he never asked for a barrel for any sinister reasons. He was asking for a grease drum. It's only three feet high and 18 inches in diameter, and he wanted it to clean his tools. While Cody was detained, police executed a search warrant on Cody's house. And I do have pictures of when they searched and they went through every single room and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. They did end up finding some red stains on the ceiling near the kitchen, and they swabbed those for testing. The results came back, and it was not blood. They determined it was most likely spaghetti sauce. They ended up finding some receipts for recent purchases of cleaning supplies, rubber gloves, and they noticed that it appeared that one area of the garage seemed to have been recently cleaned. After being cooperative and doing two interviews with investigators, Cody started to get frustrated. And in one of those interviews, after being there for several hours and them just continuing to question him about his timeline again and again, he pretty much said, you know what? It's time for me to leave. If I'm not under arrest, I'm going. He explained that he had always been there for Nicole and her kids for a long time. And he just realized the importance of finding her. But at the time, he'd already given them everything he could. They did let Amber and Cody leave, but they took his white truck in to be analyzed. When they were searching, they end up finding something suspicious, something of Nicole's, a safe. While searching Cody's truck, police looked into the diamond plate toolbox on the back of the truck and they found a black garbage bag. This garbage bag contained a small safe. They thought this safe may hold a clue to what happened to Nicole. From within the locked safe, they could see documents kind of sticking out as you can see here. And Nicole's name are on some of these documents. So why would they be in Cody's possession? This gave them cause to open it. They had a strong suspicion that Cody was responsible for whatever happened to Nicole. Investigators think that Cody knew exactly what he was doing leaving Nicole's car where he did. I told you, this place had a nickname, Stab City. They think Cody did this to throw the investigation off. If this was truly a joke, it wasn't funny. They went to Nicole's family with this information that they believed that Nicole had been murdered and that they believed Cody was the one responsible. But unfortunately, they did have to tell the family they did not have enough evidence at that moment to be able to arrest him. When investigators told Nicole's family what they thought happened to their loved one, it was unbelievable for them to imagine Cody, someone who cared for Nicole financially and otherwise, who looked after her children, could do such a thing to her. Just put her in a barrel and treat her like a piece of garbage? It was also hard for Cammy. Because remember, she was friends with Nicole, and now she had to accept the fact that she was probably dead. But it was even harder to accept the fact that her other friend, Amber, the one who was the maid of honor in her wedding, could be dating a killer. But she wouldn't be dating him for long, because in March of 2014, a year after Nicole had gone missing, Amber got engaged to Cody. And soon after that, they got married. Nicole's family was grief-stricken with a thought that their beloved Nicole had been murdered 
and the fact that the prime suspect was not in jail, but seemed to be living it up, doing whatever he wanted in his life, being happy, and acting as though nothing had changed, it made them sick. One of the investigators, Agent Mark Hillard, he wasn't going to give up. He was searching the prairies, he was searching oil fields, but this poor man, who dedicated so much time to Nicole's case, was diagnosed with stage 4 melanoma cancer in 2014, and he was unable to continue to work. He had to break the news to Nicole's family that he wasn't going to be on the case anymore, but he promised her case would be in good hands. Wait until you hear this coincidence. It's shocking. He wasn't the only one fighting cancer. Brant Light, the prosecuting attorney, ended up finding out he had lung cancer, and they were fighting cancer side by side, getting chemo, not knowing if they were going to live long enough to figure out who killed Nicole. Believe it or not, these two men were sitting next to each other, receiving their chemotherapy, and talking about Nicole's case. They were working from the hospital. That's dedication. Two years go by. They still haven't found a body, and they still haven't arrested anyone. But that would all change in August of 2015, however, when a new piece of evidence would emerge that would bring justice to Nicole and her family. Analysts turn over cell phone information to investigators that showed where Nicole and Cody's phone had been in the days leading up to, the day of, and the days following Nicole's disappearance. Nicole's phone was placed in an area of Cody's Fairview home in the morning of Valentine's Day, where everyone had expected that she actually was that morning. But Cody's story started to fall apart because the evidence showed that it didn't appear he'd ignored Nicole at all and went to bed that morning. Instead, it shows Cody calling Nicole multiple times. And it shows as he's making these calls that he appears to be traveling from the work site closer to his home. It also showed Cody's phone showing up back at his home at 7.26 a.m., only one minute after Nicole's final text message had been sent. By this time, Agent Hilliard was back. He was still going through chemo, but he was back on the job in between. And he was the one that got to put the handcuffs on the person that they charged with Nicole's murder, Cody Johnston. This helped investigators to feel as though they now had enough information available that they could arrest Cody. And on August 25th, 2015, they charged him with the deliberate homicide of Nicole Waller. Now it was time to piece together the evidence and try to determine what exactly happened on Valentine's Day of 2013 and why it happened. Police learned that Cody and Nicole had a buy-sell agreement on that trailer that he purchased for her and the children, remember that? And she would pay him $2,000 in $100 payments per month. However, turns out they found out that Cody was texting Amber just a few weeks before Nicole went missing. And Amber was insisting that Cody end the relationship with Nicole, especially if he wanted to continue to see her. Plus, she even said she wanted to get Nicole evicted from the double wide as part of the deal. Even though they don't think Amber had anything physically to do with Nicole's disappearance, they do think that what she said to Cody about how she wouldn't be with him if Nicole wasn't out of the picture definitely contributed in their minds to the fact that he wanted to do just that get rid of Nicole. And right before Valentine's Day, just in time for Valentine's Day weekend, Amber was putting a lot of pressure on Cody to make a choice. And he was telling her that he was going to get that trailer back. And when I look back through the photos of Cody's house during that search, I saw a Valentine's Day gift on the table. And I couldn't help but think, was that a gift to Amber? Or a gift from Amber? Did she get her Valentine's Day wish to spend it with Cody that night? while Nicole was dead. He had a friend who was a handyman. The night before Valentine's Day was when Cody had his friend put padlocks on Nicole's home while Nicole was with him. Cody, knowing that Nicole's leaving, her car is all packed up, he gets his high school buddy Frank to go over and put padlocks on the doors and screw the windows closed so that Nicole wouldn't be able to get back in when she got home. That's kind of messed up. Nicole's ex-husband, Jason, was the one that drove by and saw the padlocks on her house, and he informed her this was bound to have caused an argument between Nicole and Cody. And this led to Nicole calling Cody that Valentine's Day morning to let him know that he would not be getting the trailer and he wouldn't be getting the money. They believe that this alone was the last straw for Cody. He left work angry, 
and confronted Nicole before she left, possibly to get back that buy-sell agreement, which is why that safe becomes important and significant because inside that safe was the sales agreement. When Cody showed up days later at her house, that's when he was trying to retrieve the safe with the sales agreement inside. Cody explained to investigators that he believed he still owned the double wide trailer because he was the one that initially purchased it and Nicole still owed him money. So he did decide to go have a friend put locks on it to secure it. Probably not the nicest thing to do, but they were in a breakup. He had been lied to. He was feeling some sort of way about the whole situation. It was Cody's choice to end the relationship. Nicole had still tried to invite Cody to have dinner with her and a movie at his house on February 13th, but Cody just decided he needed space. Something else investigators found was that Nicole wasn't calling Cody that morning. He was calling her over and over and over again while he was getting closer and closer to his house where she was, getting angrier and angrier, they suspect. According to the cell phone data, the GPS coordinates, and the towers, Cody arrives back in Fairview at his home a minute after she texted Mark that she was on her way home. They believed that when Cody arrived at his home, he attacked Nicole really quickly, and many think that because there was no blood, he ended up strangling her to death. At 9.30 that morning, he's over at his friend Bill's house asking for barrels and to help ditch Nicole's vehicle. And not only that, between 9.30 a.m. and 12.30, his phone was off. Later at 1 p.m., he visits a convenience store and they get him on camera. And there was no other time where in the middle of a random day at a random time, he turned off his phone for several hours. It just didn't happen. So it's obvious that there was a reason because he was trying to avoid being tracked. Why? But the real nail in the coffin for Cody, so to speak, was when he was asking friends to pretend they were Nicole from Nicole's Facebook account and message her sister. A couple of those friends said, hell no, but he finally got one of them to do his dirty work. That person came forward because they felt terrible about what they had done. Cody had been offered a plea deal, which stated that if he were to plead guilty and lead them to where Nicole's body was, he would receive 80 years in prison and possible parole after 17 years, but he declined. This meant the case had to go to trial, and maybe that's what the attorneys wanted. Maybe the defense attorneys were hoping that Prosecutor Brant Light would die, just succumb to his cancer, who knows. Of course, there would have been someone else appointed to take his position, but here's the thing. This prosecutor, he got off his chemotherapy three weeks before this trial against doctor's orders, he risked his own life so he could have the energy to fight this case. He knew if he was on chemotherapy, he would not be able to have the energy. He would be too tired to see it all the way through. He did have two assistants helping him in case something happened. Three and a half years after Nicole disappeared, Cody's trial began in October of 2016. And despite investigators and prosecutors' certainty, that Cody had been the one responsible for Nicole's disappearance and assumed murder. In the state of Montana, a person had never been charged with deliberate homicide, known as first degree murder in some other states, without a body ever being found. During the trial, Amber, who is now Cody's wife, was in the front row with their child, a newborn baby. It was heartbreaking for them to know that Cody's life went on while Nicole's was ended leaving her three babies behind. Much to prosecutor surprise, Cody ended up taking the stand as the only witness for the defense. Cody did admit to certain things when he took the stand. However, they were mostly things that the prosecution witnesses had already testified to and claimed that Cody had done. Cody admitted to the fact that he had gotten a friend to log into Nicole's Facebook and message Carmen days after she disappeared. Why? He claimed it was just harmless and that it would take some of the attention off of him because he was kind of like their prime suspect at the time. He told the court how he loved Nicole. He loved her children. He took care of them, went to all of Nicole's hospital appointments, financially assisted her, helped her purchase a trailer, helped her fix it up and make it nice. He was a loving father and husband. He said he even did the right thing when Nicole lied to him. He didn't know she was lying, but when she said she was pregnant, he broke it off with the woman he was seeing, Amber, and went back to be with Nicole. But that was one of the things he couldn't handle. The fact that Nicole could carry on a lie for so long, fooling him the way that she did, he didn't feel it was right, and he couldn't get on board with it. There was something else that contributed to their breakup. 
According to him, Nicole was addicted to painkillers and he had been begging her to please get help and get into treatment. And that's when I took a look back at the pictures of her vehicle and I realized what I was looking at. According to him, she had been making trips to methadone clinics every couple weeks because she was indeed addicted. And that's very sad. And these bottles that were in her vehicle, I took a real good look at them. Look what's on here. It has her name, when it was dispensed, and the drug, methadone. It's similar to morphine. Now, prosecutors argued that Nicole had been clean for months, but Cody insisted it wasn't true. The reason they broke up the day before Valentine's Day was because he found out she was using again. The bottles from her car have the date on it. And this shows that he might be telling the truth. The bottle says it was dispensed on February 1st. He says Nicole refused to go to treatment because she said she couldn't. She had kids to take care of. None of this changes the fact that something happened to Nicole. Cody also admitted that he had lied to investigators. Remember when he said he hadn't left work that day until lunch? Well, he admitted that he actually left at the time the phone records showed he did. Oh, that's convenient. Cause you know, they don't lie. He had gotten worried about Nicole and her well-being. Since they broke up and he knew she was doing drugs, he drove back over there towards his house. But when he got there, he said that Nicole's vehicle was still there, but that she was nowhere to be found. So he claimed that he just assumed that she had gone to the store to purchase some cigarettes or that someone came to pick her up. Lastly, he also admitted to the fact that he had moved Nicole's vehicle saying that he knows it was childish and vindictive, but he did it because he was mad and he just wanted to kind of like get back at her, make it hard for her to get back to her car. Even though the prosecutors didn't think that Cody would take the stand, Brant Light prepared hundreds of questions for him just in case. And he got the chance to cross-examine him and he went hard. One of those questions was, this is all about you getting away with murder, correct? To which obviously Cody said no. Oh, and I have to mention this. Cody ends up making a big mistake when he's on the stand. The prosecutor asked him, after dumping Nicole's vehicle, hiding her body, you spent the weekend with Amber, correct? And Cody says, yes. <laughs> but then he's like, wait, 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 wait a minute, no. And then he clarified, I didn't dump her body, but yes, I did spend the weekend with Amber. Wow. A little too late, the prosecutor concluded in the state's closing argument the following statement. Somewhere in Montana, Nicole Waller lies in a cold and lonely grave, taken from her children, taken from her family by that man, Cody Johnston. That's sad. The trial concluded in four days and the jury only took three hours to deliberate and come back with a guilty verdict. Cody was found guilty of one count of deliberate homicide and found guilty on one count of tampering with physical evidence. This is the first case in Montana where they got a guilty verdict of murder without a body. After the verdict was read, Cody went and hugged Amber and it was sad. They embraced and they were both crying. And what I found heartwarming was that Nicole's sister Carmen turned to her friend Angie and she said, is it weird that I just want to go over there and hug Amber? After all, she was losing her husband and the father of her newborn at that time. But that just goes to show you the heart that Nicole's family had. What's really frightening is when I look at this text message. I see the one that says your dog needs food at 651, but look at the one before it. You can only see a portion of it, but it was never mentioned anywhere. It said, partially, killed me over and over and over and for the life of me, I'll never know what the rest of the text message says, but I can only assume it said something like, with everything you've done to me, it has killed me over and over and over, as though the pain she was going through, whatever they were going through during this breakup, I'm assuming, was killing her. I don't like to make these speculations, but at the same time, it is very interesting, and I can't help but think, what was that about? And the fact that she said, killed me over and over and then she ends up dead. It's really eerie, especially now that we know who's responsible. Sentencing was in January of 2017 and a new face was in the courtroom, Nicole's daughter, Ashlyn. She was only 12 years old when her mom went missing. She was 12, that poor little girl. She took the stand to provide a victim impact statement. Quote, I always tried to protect my mother from her boyfriends because I was afraid something like this would happen. She would ask me, why can't you let me be happy? I tried to let her be happy with Cody, but now I feel like I could have saved her. I feel like it's my fault, end quote. I feel so bad because it's not her fault. 
It is not. She could not have done anything differently that would have made a different outcome here. It's someone's choice. It's someone's evil choice to take someone's life, to harm them. And it breaks my heart that her daughter would even feel that way. But I understand how hard it is when you do in your heart feel like you could have done something different. At the time of Cody's sentencing, according to the Sydney Herald, out of the 400 no-body cases in the history of the United States, there had only been 80 that had resulted in life sentences, which is what the prosecution was looking for. Brant Light spoke during the sentencing hearing, and he let it be known that he felt like Cody deserved a life sentence, saying, quote, The defendant should not be rewarded for successfully hiding Nicole's body. The defendant has had a chance to bring comfort to the victim's family by telling us where the body is, but he refuses. Due to the horrendous nature and effect that this crime has had on the victim's family, this case screams for the defendant to be held accountable, end quote. Prosecutors asserted that despite the fact that Nicole's body had never been found, there was no sign that she was still alive. She had a Western Union bank account where she would receive her child support payments by direct deposit, and it had continued to receive these payments many, many months after she disappeared, but despite this money accumulating in her account, none of it was ever withdrawn. That's another thing. She never reached out to her children again, and her family knew she would never do that. It would have to take death. That was the only thing that would separate her from her own children. After hearing multiple testimonies during the sentencing phase of the trial, Cody ended up being sentenced to life in prison for the deliberate homicide of Nicole Waller, and he also received a 10-year sentence on top of that for tampering with physical evidence. Still today, Cody maintains his innocence in Nicole's disappearance and her suspected murder. This man ends up doing an inmate interview with Dateline, and Josh Mankiewicz interviewed him. This was only a little while after the trial, and Cody was still claiming that he was innocent. When Josh interviewed him, he said, you know you're putting Nicole's family through agony. If you know where Nicole's body is, tell them. And he said, you know, I know I'd be doing that if I knew where she was, but I don't. He also said he planned to appeal and he wanted his son to know that he loves him and he didn't do it. Cody claimed he was sorry that he lied. He was sorry that he moved Nicole's car. But then the interviewer from Dateline got to see another side of him. When he starts to press him a little more, he goes off. He gets super defensive, he blows up, he says, I'm done. He even said F you to Josh. He said F you, you beep. I mean, it was bad. He called him arrogant. And then he's like, how's that? Cody said, I'm not gonna let you make me look like an a-hole. And all I have to say is, I think you're doing a pretty good job of that yourself, buddy. After seeing that interview, I don't have a doubt, not one doubt in my mind for a second that this guy did it. It's clear to me, it was clear before, but after I saw him blow up like that, I can tell he's an angry person. He's currently appealing his conviction with the Montana Supreme Court and seeking a new trial. He and his attorneys allege that the prosecution violated his rights and they argue that he wasn't given a fair trial, which they believe should be grounds for a reversal of his conviction and a new trial. As of now, Cody will first be eligible for parole in 2049. Prosecutor Brant Light died a day before Christmas in 2020 after 11 years of battling lung cancer. But Nicole's family is forever grateful, as many other families that he has helped throughout his career. One of those families wrote in his obituary, quote, you are a good man, Brant Light. Your efforts changed the ending of a story for us. My dad, brother, and sister are eternally grateful for your tenacity and your resilience in prosecuting the accused person. It wasn't easy. It took everything out of all of us. I don't know the hours or the exact sacrifices you made to be able to get that guilty verdict, but we want you to know that we saw what you did. We felt what you did, and we rest our heads at night in peace because of your efforts. Nicole Waller's body has never been found, which is hard for her family. Her sister Carmen says, I don't have a place to go to talk to her or to spread ashes. She says that every year on Nicole's birthday, May 22nd, she has a cupcake that she puts a candle on and lights the candle and blows it out and she makes one wish. And she says that that wish has not changed since Nicole disappeared. And that wish is that Cody or somebody will come forward and let her family know where Nicole is. Nicole's daughter, Ashlyn, has two babies of her own. They were born in 2020 and 2022, both beautiful little baby daughters. And Nicole's two sons, were living with their father the last time I checked on Facebook. It's truly sad to lose someone 
but it's truly devastating when you don't have a way to have closure to not know where nicole's body is is still haunting the death alone is devastating but to know you can't lay that person to rest is even more devastating it's also very sad that this case took place on a day that's supposed to be full of love valentine's day i'm so sorry to nicole's family to her children and i also hope that one day with modern technology somehow some way or if someone comes forward that we will find nicole i want to thank you so very much for being here for nicole's story and i will see you soon in my next video bye